An enclosed space is a space that is not used for day-to-day -day activity and which has any of the following characteristics. A limited opening for entry and exit, inadequate ventilation, and is not designed for continuous worker occupancy. The presence of any one of the characteristics as stated above can make a space an enclosed space. A ship-specific list should be available to identify all enclosed spaces on board and should be displayed in public spaces. The most common confined spaces on board ships are cargo holds, chain lockers, coffer dams, water tanks, void spaces, duct keels, fuel tanks, engine crankcases, exhaust and scavenge receivers. Any area on the ship that has been left closed for any length of time without ventilation must be considered dangerous. Changes in the environment of a space that is not labeled unsafe can also make space unsafe, for example, failure of fixed ventilation or the migration of hazardous vapors from an adjacent hazardous space. It is best practice not to enter a dangerous space, however, onboard crew members have to enter enclosed spaces for a number of reasons including routine inspection of ballast and double-bottom tanks, checking if a tank is dry before loading, cleaning of tanks or holds, maintenance including painting, repairing, etc. Restricted or limited space in any compartment can make working and rescue attempts from such chambers difficult and challenging. Personnel should understand the layout of an enclosed space before attempting entry. Appropriate lighting equipment should be provided to compensate for inadequate natural light in confined spaces. There is also the risk of personal injury due to slips, trips, and falls on surfaces and obstructions. Oxygen in any compartment can be reduced due to many factors. Rusting of steel parts is the most common one. Rusting is the process of oxidation, meaning oxygen is consumed. Oxygen can also be consumed by activities like hot work, welding, or the occurrence of fire. The acceptable range of oxygen in an enclosed space is between 19.5% to 23%. The boatmaster has to ensure that the equipment and methods used for measuring the oxygen content provide accurate results for all areas of the confined space. The hazards of flammable gases could be present in fuel and offshore chemicals tanks, as well as spaces adjacent to these tanks. The boatmaster has to check for the presence flammable gases in spaces where hot work, or spark potential work, is planned. The boatmaster can find the flammable range of any chemical from the material safety data sheet. The flammable range is the concentration range in which a flammable substance can produce a fire or explosion when an ignition source, such as a spark or open flame, is present. The concentration is generally expressed as percent fuel by volume. Above the upper flammable limit, UFL, the mixture of substance and air, is too rich in fuel, and too deficient in oxygen, to burn. This is sometimes called the upper explosive limit, UEL. Below the lower flammable limit, LFL, the mixture of substance and air lacks sufficient fuel, substance, to burn. This is sometimes called the lower explosive limit, LEL. Any concentration between the upper and lower limits can ignite or explode, use extreme caution. Being above the upper limit is not particularly safe either. If a confined space is above the upper flammable limit and is then ventilated or open to an air source, the vapor will be diluted and the concentration can drop into the flammable limit range. The most common toxic gases found in confined spaces are carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. These gases are usually measured by means of substance-specific electrochemical toxic gas sensors. Gas that enters the sensor undergoes a reaction that produces an electric current from the sensor that is proportional to the concentration of gas. Volatile organic chemical, VOC, vapors are potentially present in many confined spaces as well, especially spaces associated with the oil and petrochemical industry. VOC vapors are often toxic at very low concentrations. VOCs are normally measured by means of photoionization detector sensors that measure in parts per million, ppm, or even smaller increments. The atmosphere within a confined space must be tested using equipment that is designed to detect the chemical 
chemicals that may be present at levels that are well below the defined exposure limits. Evaluation testing is done to determine what chemical hazards are or may become present in the space's atmosphere, and to identify what steps must be followed and what conditions must be met to ensure that atmospheric conditions are safe for a worker to enter the space. For confined spaces that are deep or have areas leading away from the entry point, the atmosphere may may be layered or may be different in remote areas. For these spaces, testing must be done at different levels and in all available areas. For each test required on the permit, you must allow enough time for the air from the space to be drawn into the equipment and for the sensor, or other detection device, to react to the chemical if it is present. This is considered the minimum response time and it will be noted by the manufacturer in the operator's manual. Be aware that you will need to add time to this minimum response time if you have attached hosing or a probe extension to the inlet. The additional time is needed to allow the air from the different depths of the space to be pulled into the equipment inlet. If a sample probe is used to do the testing, it will have to be purged between samples. The nature of confined spaces makes communication challenging. You should equip an entrance with a connected, personal confined space monitor that automatically shares alarms and gas readings from within the confined space with peers and an attendant. This connectivity lets the team continue their work without depending on manual check-ins that disrupt productivity at best and at worst, can cost someone their life if timed incorrectly. If a hazardous atmosphere is detected during entry, each person must leave the space immediately. The confined space must be evaluated to determine how the hazardous atmosphere developed and to identify measures that must be implemented to protect employees from the hazardous atmosphere before any other entries take place. An emergency escape breathing device, EBD, is a compact, portable apparatus. The EBD is designed to provide a person with a short-term supply of breathable air. In emergency situations, the EBD can save lives. Emergency escape breathing devices are used in various industries and environments. In the maritime industry, they are used to escape from toxic or oxygen deficit in confined spaces on board. Confined spaces entrants are already putting themselves into an area with known dangers. But it can get even more dangerous if machinery unexpectedly gets turned on or tons of water or oil begins to fall on you or your team. The key to controlling potentially hazardous energy sources such as these is to first identify potential problems and then take control of the energy source, whether it's a switch, valve or other starting mechanism. Failure to recognize dangerous enclosed spaces and all hazards associated with them is the leading cause of fatalities and accidents on ships. Lack of awareness on the hazards of the confined spaces on board, and unplanned and poorly executed entries result in accidents. A range of safeguards exist to protect against accidents and injury in enclosed spaces, and these should be taken seriously. Checklists are prepared for a reason. They facilitate carrying out the necessary safety precautions and safe confined space entry operations. They prevent the incorrect use of critical safety equipment. The vessel safety management system should be implemented properly. The boatmaster has to address any lack of understanding among the crew and ensure compliance with the company's procedures. Checklists should not be treated as a tick box exercise. Risk assessment is one of the core preparation tools for enclosed space entry. It is designed to minimize the possibility of accidents by dealing with every aspect of the entry, identifying the hazards, deciding the control measures and finding alternatives or solutions or means to mitigate the risks. Risk assessment should be performed every time before man entry. A list of the work to be done should be made for the ease of assessment, for example, if welding is to be carried out, or some pipe replacement, etc. This helps in carrying out the work quickly and easily. Potential hazards are to be identified, such as the presence of toxic gases. Opening and securing has to be done, and precautions should be taken to check if the opening of enclosed space is pressurized or not. All fire hazard possibilities should be minimized if hot work is to be carried out. 
This includes testing and monitoring adjacent spaces. The confined space has to be well ventilated before entering. Enough time should be allowed to establish a ventilation system to ensure that air containing enough oxygen to sustain life is introduced. Ventilation can either be natural or mechanical using blowers. When working in confined spaces, an important question for the boatmaster to consider is what to do if someone becomes injured, incapacitated or trapped in a space and has to be rescued. One of the best ways to prepare is to practice. There are many theories about the best practices for confined space rescue and rescue drills allow the boatmaster and the crew to test those theories. Rescue drills provide personnel the experience of working through different scenarios in order to familiarize themselves with situations they could encounter in confined spaces. Conducting rescue drills helps prepare teams for working in confined spaces, and when necessary, rescuing co-workers. Rescues fall into two categories, there are time-sensitive and non-time-sensitive rescues. Time-sensitive or emergency rescues typically involve oxygen-deficient atmospheres where there is a small window of time, typically six minutes, to get someone out. An example of a non-time-sensitive rescue would be a situation in which someone falls and breaks an ankle going into a confined space. In these types of circumstances there are sufficient O2 levels and, therefore, the rescue is not as time-sensitive and can be conducted without the use of supplemental oxygen. Understanding both types of rescues helps boatmasters develop strategies for implementing and executing an appropriate response. Keeping to the procedures is the rescuer's first defense against injury or death. It is human nature to want to save a colleague, and in this thought, rescuers rush in without taking proper safety precautions. Unplanned and poorly executed rescue attempts often end in more fatalities. Acting on emotion and instinct and disregarding knowledge and training can result in more casualties. Of all the equipment involved in confined space rescue, Perhaps the most important is the full body harness. Many rescues require lifting equipment to remove a person from a confined space, and that lifting equipment will need to attach to a full body harness. Boatmasters need to ensure that they have fully equipped and trained confined space rescue team ready to re respond in an emergency situation. Regardless of the confined space or opening, a rescue team needs to be prepared and ready to respond in a timely manner if someone is injured trapped or incapacitated.